Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. It was just another ordinary, miraculous day, and they were going to go uh, for a walk on the beach. And then all of a sudden, a dazzling moment comes along. He kneels down. Will you marry me? <laughs> yes, yes, she said. I'll marry you. Uh, this moment, this moment, this moment. We just want to stay there, right? I mean, I, she's fumbling to try to get a picture to, to, to take it so that we just want to stay right here. Such, such a moment, such a moment for them. As it turns out, go down the road a piece and she'll actually end up telling her children and her grandchildren about this story for time to come, which, by the way, never would have happened if they didn't leave that moment. And we gather together as family around pictures and we tell the story. We recount these moments. We remember and give thanks for our blessings. We retell the story and we see it through a new lens as the story unfolds and our, our lives go on. And even after she's gone, the children and grandchildren till, still tell the story because it's, it's shaped their identity. It's shaped who they are as a foundation. And if you can understand that, then you can understand what worship is, why we gather together for liturgy. Liturgy, the work of the people. We gather together as a family around our family table and we, we get to our, our, our family picture album. We call it the Bible. And we remember, we recount God's mighty acts. By the way, that's the definition for the word praise. You ever go to church and they're like, praise God, praise God, praise God. And at that point, I want to go, well, man, get to it. Tell the story. Tell the story about God's mighty acts of deliverance and what God has done for us, which is what we do when we gather around and we hear these scriptures. It's not just a time for us to bore you to death. Oh, yeah, I've heard that one before. So the beginning of the Epiphany season, we got out our pictures, right? And we, we told this picture about that day that, that Jesus went down to the Jordan and, and the sky opened up. And, and the dove came down. The Holy Spirit descended upon him. And the voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Do you remember that? Because Epiphany is about manifestation, making known. It's about, about us kind of going, oh, that, that's who you are. It's about identity. Who is this Jesus? Well, he's more than a carpenter's boy. And so all this time we've been telling the story. And then so today we get to six days before. Six days before what? Did you catch that at the beginning? Well, it was six days before they were up on the mountain. Let me pull out the picture for you. You remember when, um, when they were up there on the mountain? And, and they said, who do you say that I am? And Peter just sort of blurted out, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And he says, congratulations, Peter, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Same thing going on in Corinthians. You didn't come to believe on your own. What does Martin Luther say? I cannot on my own come to believe or know or understand the Lord Jesus Christ, but he has called, enlightened, and sanctified us all through the Holy Spirit. I can't boast in this. Paul's saying I can't boast in this. He unveiled my mind to have belief in Christ so that we would shine with this light in the world to work for him. So Epiphany Pictures, Revelation. We keep telling these stories. Why? Because then we remember who we are and not what the world's telling us we are. We remember. That's right. I'm a redeemed Child of God that he has bought back. I forgot this week. And then we also remember who God is. The mighty creator of the universe who loves us so much. He'll do anything to save us. So, have you ever been looking at a picture before and you go, <laughs> you know, in the background, I, I forgot about that ice cream shop. They've torn it down since then. I didn't, I didn't really notice that before. I, and, and you sort of retell the story. And the same thing happens with scriptures, doesn't it? Um, Gary T. Kovar, he, used to, he grew up here. He was here when I got here, one of the youth. And, and he wrote back to me. He was so excited this week. He said, well, I want you to tell St. Timothy that when, when, when he says in Philippians, I thank God, I always thank my God when I think of you. He said, tell St. Timothy that. Now, now he's a dad, he's got kids, he's, he's over in Jacksonville, and he's like excited in this text to tell me about what he's discovering about Philippians and how he never saw it that way before. You ever been there? Yes? You, you can talk back. Okay. 
It, where, where you're looking at scripture, you go, I never noticed that before. But now I notice it. You know, this, it's active and alive, like sharper than any two-edged sword, this word that we get from God. And so from it, we get these things, as Paul says, I pass on a first importance what was given to me. Um, we pass on, you, did, you do know that the church isn't just for one generation, amen? amen? But sometimes I think in the United States of America, we think that it is, because we try to do everything, gear everything towards one generation. And they'll even say things like this. This church, we're so hip and happening, we don't have any of that doctrine stuff. You heard that before? I have, right? None of this doctrine stuff. You know what they're saying to you? I just want you to know. Doctrine means teaching. So we really don't have any teaching for you here. <laughs> this is what they're saying. Just, just understand that when you go into it. Because things that we pass on were a big deal. And, and I'm leading to what's going on in the gospel today that you may not have picked up on. We have this teaching, this doctrine, that Jesus is 100% human and 100% God. You ever heard that before? Right? Well, you know, that, that was a big deal because they started teaching all sorts of things in the early church when they started to get a little bit further along. Some said, you know, no, 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 Christ was made. He, he, he was all just human being. And then other people said, no, 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 he was just God. He wasn't really human. It didn't really hurt when he was nailed to the cross. Right, And so they get together to make these creeds that we have. And from that, it was forged for us. In fact, that's why we have two candles on the altar, the divine and human nature of Christ. 100% God, 100% human. Why am I bringing this up? Because it's in our text today. Where do I get this? I get it from Scripture. In the passage today, we witness this. The voice of God comes from the cloud, and it says what? This is my beloved Son, the Son of God. He's of the same substance of the God who was there before the beginning of everything being made. All things are made through him. Not one thing came into being that wasn't made through him. This word that comes from God that is God. And because God is God, when he comes clashing with a, a broken, fallen, sinful world, well, you know what the world does to love. It crucifies it. And he experiences suffering and death. But when the holy comes, unlike this world that just wants to kill and, and make for itself, he came to show us a different way. He came to show us that God forgives us and he saves us. And the ways of heaven, the ways of holiness are not like the ways of this broken, sinful world that we live in. He is 100% God. Well, okay, I get that. Where are you getting the 100% human? Did you notice in that last verse? Um, in the last verse, he refers to himself going down the mountain as what? The son of man. Son of man. 100% human. I'm, I'm, I'm flesh and blood. Uh, uh, when I rise from the dead, I'll be flesh and blood. Do you remember this? He says, here, touch, see, feel. Touch me and see that I'm not cast with a ghost. I'm human. Oh, and by the way, I've risen from the dead, and this is the way it's going to be in eternity. Flesh has been restored. We believe in the resurrection of the body, the flesh, and the blood. We also have it in the book of Daniel, back in the Old Testament. This title comes from Daniel, the seventh chapter, verses 13 to 14. And when he, when he talks about that, when Daniel talks about that, he's talking about God, his future return in power and glory. That when the Son of Man comes, he says, he will come in power and glory, foretelling about Christ. And then Jesus uses that same title to refer to himself in Mark 8, 38, 13, 26, and 14, 62. 100% God, 100% man. It's a doctrine. I hope you don't find that too stodgy. But, you know, um, we're actually a church that has doctrine. I mean, teaching. I mean, we didn't invent this ourselves. It's been handed down to us for centuries through the power of the Holy Spirit. Transfiguration Sunday is a day that reaches the summit of epiphany, of Christ being made known to us. This future picture of the final outcome of the resurrection of Jesus Christ for just a minute. In the Gospel of Luke, when we get to the tomb, we're going to find how many witnesses are there? Two. Two. <laughs> Look at that. Two. Now, this glimpse for just a moment, this picture of heaven. Imagine a picture of something that's ahead of you that hasn't happened yet. My son happens to be here in the congregation. He's 16 years old, as far as I know. He doesn't have any children. <laughs> and I'm trying to imagine my son 
coming to me and going, hey, Dad, look at this picture of my family and my grandchildren. I mean, I'd be, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm happy, but I'm not happy. And like, what's been, uh, wait, uh, and, and we started to get this feeling like, what was going on in the disciples at this moment? What? Uh, I'm not quite sure. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get to is if in Christ, you don't understand everything, good. Neither did the disciples. And quit putting that pressure on yourself that you need to have it all figured out. That you need to have it all understood. We walk by faith, not by sight. And Christ, it's like that dazzling moment of a marriage proposal on the beach. How could you possibly understand all that will come and all that this will come to mean? Right? I think about my own experience. It was around a campfire and I knelt down and um, proposed to my dear wife, Laura. But I had no idea, like Noah, Joshua, Micah, Laura, I had no idea about all of this, what was going to happen. Now that I look back on it, I realize I had no clue. It was a cool moment. It's a moment I want to keep. Part of me wanted to just stay there in that moment. But we had to move on. Imagine you're hiking with Jesus. And all of a sudden, he's transfigured, dazzling white, light shooting out of him. And he, his, his, he's whiter than any bleach on earth could get him. And then, if as, that wasn't enough, you see Moses and Elijah, who have been gone, remember, for hundreds, thousands of years. What? And then... You're getting all nervous energy, and this voice from heaven comes down from the cloud. Okay. <sighs> what a moment. You come back down the moment, and Jesus says, oh, by the way, uh, don't tell anyone about this. <laughs> so you're there with them in, in, in this moment, and I can just sort of imagine the disciples coming down like when, when Jesus is like maybe a couple steps ahead of them or behind them, and they're, they're kind of like, Whoa, what, what, what just happened? No, I mean, we're not supposed to tell anyone till, till after what? Resurrection? I mean, what is that? I don't even know what that is. How, what? Do you get it? Because I don't get it. Can you kind of see the disciples in that moment? And there they are just kind of going down the hill together. And then can you imagine after the resurrection? They share the family picture. And they go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I remember that moment. Now I get it. Now I know what it means. Now I know what was going on. He was giving us a glimpse because we actually walked and ate with the resurrected Christ. And, and we saw him ascend up into heaven. And, and, oh, yeah, it makes all sense in the world right now of what was going on. It was like a glimpse into eternity. It's a glimpse into the resurrection. It's God giving you a little heads up, answer to the test. He's telling you that nothing, nothing, nothing is lost in God. How cool is that? How many of us are dealing with loss, right? Dealing with something and we're kind of dealing with this human existence. Nothing is lost in God. It's all return. And more than that, all are alive in Christ. Do you remember when he's with the Sadducees and they don't even believe in the resurrection? And, and Jesus kind of cuts to the chase and he's like, listen, listen to me, man. Abraham is alive to God. You know, the guy that lived way back then? He's alive to God. Elijah, Moses are alive to God. Your great, 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 great grandchildren are alive to God. Mind-blowing, I know. But God's the God of the living, not of the dead. That's the God we have. And I know it's hard for you to understand in this broken, dying world that you live in, but this is my little glimpse for you to know that God's the God of the living. So along the way, they understand. That's important for us to know, right? Along the way, understanding gets deeper. Like walk, the walk to Emmaus, right? You remember that? Like, what? Huh? Who is this guy? All of a sudden, he starts unfolding Scripture to them, and it starts to come alive. And it says, and he opened their minds to the Scriptures, and all of a sudden, you can just kind of see them sitting around the tables going, whoa, 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 whoa. I remember this. Oh, and now, now I, I get Moses, why Moses was there. 
Because Moses was the giver of the law, and the law revealed that, you know, it was a way to try to be right with God, and then we also realized that none of us could keep the law, and we couldn't make ourselves right with God, but Jesus will fulfill what the law requires to make us right with God. So now, we can trust what God has done in Jesus rather than our own sacrifices and our own falling short that seems to keep happening again and again. I get it! And, 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 and Elijah... Well, then that makes sense now, too. Because all the prophets, what did they do? They were the mouthpiece for God. They're the ones that told us what God's going to do. And you don't have to believe me. Check it out for yourself. Go, go do a history lesson on all that. Dig as deep as you want to dig. It's only going to transform you. You're going to find out that God keeps all of his promises. And the reason Elijah is there is because God keeps all his promises. Everything that he said he was going to do in the prophets, he did. And it all points to Jesus. And so both the law and the prophets melt in to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And so we only see Jesus on this mount of being transfigured that we're all a part of. To him alone be the glory, Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen on that? To him alone be glory and honor. I could see us in this moment. How, you know how it would be? If it was now, I guarantee you we'd be pulling out our phone. Jesus, Moses, Elijah, move over a little more, okay? I just want to kind of get you together. I, I just cannot wait. I cannot wait to post this so everyone will know how cool I am. Peter recognizes how good it is to be here. Maybe we can identify with Peter. He wants to do something. I, I, I want to do something. We're here in this moment. I got to do something. All right, for a lot of us, aren't that, that, that's the way we are. I, I, I can't just be. I got to do something. When God is already doing something. <laughs> Be still and know that I am God. Quiet. Silence. Just listen. We can get that way too. When things are good in our life, when we're actually on a high with Jesus, we just want to stay there. Let's stay at Luther Springs, right? Let's stay on this mountaintop experience so that we don't have to leave it. That's not where God leaves us. We also like to have a place where we can keep God so that whenever we need it, we can have God in the God box. Like 812 East Tarpon. I'm telling you, God's bigger than this place. He's everywhere in your life. But we like to kind of keep it there. You know why? Because we want to control it. And then in our frenzied busyness, we miss that God is actually doing something. I, I look around and observe, and maybe you do too. It's like we spend more time filming our life than living it. How many photos do you have in your phone and videos? I mean, I, I can see right now, you know, I remember the Olympics and I'm watching it and that's when it hit me. It's like they're, the Olympics, all of these athletes are walking in and they're filming this instead of like, man, are you kidding me? This is your one time in life to be in the Olympics. Drink it all in. Don't, I, do you know how many videos there's going to be out there of this actual moment that's going on? Can you just take it in and live it and be with the people next to you and look them in the eye? Take note that according to Jewish expectation, as stated, stated by the prophet Zechariah, 14th chapter, verses 16 to 21, God would usher in the new age of the day of the Lord during the feast of the booze. What's that? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Um, it's a celebration of the Jewish people that God commanded where they would, on their way to Jerusalem, remember God's provision in the wilderness after the exodus and the slavery. You know, like he took them out in the wilderness and he provided for them. And so they would remember, oh, that's right, God provides. Here's a snapshot. And so they would build these booths. They still do it to this day, some of them. And, and, and we remember that. We celebrate that, who God is. Which might explain why Peter has a desire to build booths with them, convinced that the end times are coming. And the feast of the booths was upon them. He also is probably remembering Malachi 4, 4 to 6, where Moses is mentioned. And also Elijah is promised to return before the day of the Lord, which Jesus would tell us is actually John the Baptist. Along with Peter, we come to understand it is not our job to build a place for God. But I want to stop right there and how often do we frenzy ourselves with trying to, set, to do all this work for God, right? Well, how do we get more people in here? How do we, um, when God is making of us a house 
for the crucified and risen one in us. We are the living temple of God, and he is building it in us, transforming it in us through the Holy Spirit. Capiche? Yeah. This is more than a picture spot. Do you ever get those picture spots and people are like, oh, I guess I better take a picture. <laughs> and it usually is a pretty spot. Um, this is more than a picture spot. This is the big picture. God is at work in Jesus to save us. This is all encompassing of all time and place into eternity. The picture reveals a shining light that God has come down to us. Jesus came down to show us God. Oh, we say it all the time, right? It's been passed down for centuries now. Brothers and sisters in every century have said it. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. This is the good news. Jesus leaves perfection and glory. Which one of us would do that? Leave everything's great. Everything in heaven. There's no sin or pain or death or sorrow. Why would you leave that? And he comes down into abandonment, ridicule, suffering, and death on the cross. Why? Why not avoid pain and seek pleasure? It's called hedonism. Here's why. Love. Not, not a feeling love. Like a committed action love. Like, I, I love you, all of y'all. I love you so much, I am not like you. I am holy, and I want to save you so that I can live with you and be in relationship with you eternally. That's why. It's the heart of the gospel, isn't it? Most of us know it. For God so loved us that he laid down his life on the cross to save our life eternally. And all he asks is that we believe. Trust me. Trust what I've done for you. With the disciples, we stand in the mystery of undeserved grace that shines on us, right? I mean, who can earn it? None of us. We stand in this light like the disciples. See him? It's like, ah, I don't deserve this love that you've given to me. And now it shapes us. Many of us, we may feel when we see Jesus, when we hear about him, in his holiness, it's just out of reach. I mean, pastor, I, I'm trying to follow him, but no matter how hard we try, it seems like we always fall dreadfully short. Listen to me. This isn't a story about us going up to God. This is a story about God coming down to us, to be with us, to be for us, through thick and thin, life and death. No matter what comes, I am with you. I will not forsake you, and I will not abandon you. So that we might live with hope, that we might live differently now. Not the way the world tells us to live, but with abundant hope. Knowing that wherever we may go, that Christ is there and that he's ahead of us. And that where Christ is now, we will one day be. Trust him. Jesus leads them back down the mountain into daily life towards suffering, confusion, and cross. Woo! <laughs> After being on the mountaintop, what is he doing? He's inviting us into his way of being. I left heaven to come down to you. Now I'm going down into the world to save it. And I'm asking you to come with me. And I'm asking you to follow me. And Jesus leads us down into the endlessness of everyday life. Right? We all experience that. Down into the nitty-gritty details of our misunderstandings, our squabblings, our, our anxieties, our disbelief, our doubts. Down into the religious and political quarrels of the day that are going to tear us apart this year. Down into our jealousies and rivalries, our poverty and our pain. And on the way down the mountain, it's as if Jesus says, here, take this snapshot with you. Take this picture. Stick it in your pocket there. Because I want you to remember and talk about this after the resurrection when times will be difficult for you. But don't be afraid. I've overcome the world. And you'll remember. When we look back on pictures, we sometimes understand more about what was going on at the time than when we were actually in the picture. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? We look back at it because we, 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 we've seen, we know. And I, when I went down to Guyana and, and Noah, my, my first son, he was just a little toddler, and, and I was away, and for the first time now, I'm a dad in a way, and I'm like, what if something happens? What if I don't get to see him again, you know? And, and I sat on the, the, the bed and, and at nighttime, and I'm, I'm saying my prayers, and I, I, I would just 
look at those pictures. And it just warmed my heart to know that, that God had given me this. The picture today is preparing us for Lent. It's preparing us for the wildernesses that we go through. Zeroing in now on the cross, because we preach Christ crucified. Not glory, not the glory we're going to get, not the healing we're going to get, not the stuff we're going to get. We're headed towards the cross as we leave this mountain, towards a future beyond the suffering in the cross to the resurrection and eternal glory. But for now, we head to the cross. We deny ourselves, and we follow Christ. A helpful picture to pull out when we're in our wilderness, a reminder in our impossible darkness that God will do what he has promised as God always has. If you don't believe me, check the family album. Go in there. It's evident. I have a picture of my dad. Now, my dad, a lot of you may not know, he died of COVID. And I was one of those people, our family was one of those people, we didn't get to see him when he died, right? We didn't get to go in and be with him because it was pretty early on in this whole thing. So then my mind goes back earlier, the picture that God gave me. My dad was in his 90s. His faculties were gone. And he would come up and he would put his hands on my shoulders. And he would just look right into my soul and smile. And it got really awkward, you know, because <laughs> he's just standing there smiling. And I was kind of, and then he would say, oh, I love you more than you know. I love you more than you know. That's, that's the picture in my heart. But, but, but understand, I think that's what this picture is for us. Can you imagine Almighty God, smiling, smiling on us. In that cloud, his sun is shining out with that to us. And he says, this is my son, the beloved. And you're in him. You're my beloved. But do me one thing, will you? Listen to him. That's all I'm asking. That's simple, isn't it? Listen to him. So what's a disciple to do in this time ahead? What are we to do? <laughs> Listen to him. Like, like Mary. You remember Mary and Martha? And Mary is sitting there and she's just immersed, immersed in Jesus' presence and in his words. That she's not doing anything else gets Martha upset. And Martha, you're distracted by many things. But you only need one thing. And Mary has chosen the right thing. And that is to be in my presence and listen to me. What can we do? It's actually not doing it all. Be in his presence and listen to his word. The verb tense, by the way, for the word listen, is the present imperative. Do you remember your English? Implying continuing action. Don't worry, I don't remember either. That's why I had to write it down. <laughs> it's a command here. And the command of this continuing action actually would be keep on listening to him. Keep on listening to him. This isn't a one and done. Be attentive. Obey everything that Jesus says and does. It will lead you to abundant life because I want you to live and I want to share this with you. It's a word to be heard by disciples in every place and time of every age and color and shape and size. Keep on listening to Jesus. Listen to Jesus, his life. His word and our family album that we have. Listen and follow what Jesus has shown and taught us. It is one thing to admire Jesus. To obey him is something else. There's a, a Dutchman. His name is Soren Kierkegaard. And he said this. He said, I've noticed there's admirers of Christ and there's followers of Christ. And there's a difference. What will we be? Admirers of Christ to pull out or following in his way. Christian faith, Christian faith is not a retreat from reality where we go into some closet and waiting for Scotty to beam us up. I know that's a Star Trek reference if you don't know what it means. So we're sitting here kind of, well, I'm just waiting for Jesus to come and, and uh, I'm on a cloister away and the world can go in a handbasket, right? No. 
the Christian faith is a new way to engage in reality. It's a new way to engage in this muck and stuff we find ourselves in. Today, Jesus gives his followers a picture of how it will all turn out to help us. From now on, they live knowing how it ends, or better yet, that it doesn't end. So that we can enter into the valley of the shadow of death with confidence and courage. No matter what happens, we follow Jesus in the way of the cross. That's what he called us to do. Willingly going down into the suffering of others around us that will be right in front of us today in love. Trusting that God will be faithful and that God keeps God's promises to us. So may the Holy Spirit strengthen us to deny ourselves this Lent. To turn to God with all of our hearts, allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us anew in his light. Knowing that God has come down to our darkest valley with a light that is stronger than any darkness that you will encounter. And that God's light will, will, will guide us home. And may the peace of God, which passes all of our understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.